Hello Canucks fans and welcome back to another episode of the Canucks Conversation brought to you by the great folks over at Montana's. Seven locations across British Columbia. We're doing a giveaway with Montana's and you've still got time to enter folks. Make sure you go over to the Canucks Army Instagram, uh, tag a couple of your friends, your crew if you will in the comment section below. Uh, follow Montana's, follow Canucks Armies. You could be entered, you will be entered to win a $100 gift card uh we're going to be announcing the winner uh, on monday the 20th uh, so be sure to go check out montana's enter our giveaway as well my name is david quadrelli i'm joined as always by the man who built the place chris faber <laughs> wearing a wow in art in honor of Artie Seelovs wearing a bow tie my co-host chris faber and our technical producer today is alex Lard. chris explain the attire today well today's valentine's day for me so uh, going out for a Valentine's dinner and, uh, yeah, I'm drinking a red tea, which is very, it's too hot right now. I just took a sip of it and it burned my tongue, but, uh, I'm going up for Valentine's day. So this is my Valentine's, uh, show outfit today. It was an intentional pink bow tie or do you have multiple colors to choose from? Uh, just got the one bow tie actually. So yeah, I guess it, it just worked well. It works well with the shirt, works well with the bow tie. I like the look and it's, uh, yeah, it's my, uh, Valentine's day. I'm excited. Big dinner tonight. So I'm pumped about that. So I'm excited. And the whole cookie thing got handled as well in the house yesterday. Uh, my fiance was very happy with the, uh, with the cookie. And she said, maybe, you know, it was fresh, like you said, so that uh, it's behind us now, quad. You don't have to feel bad for disrespecting my fiance anymore. It's behind us. So don't worry about it. You don't even need to bring it up. I wasn't planning on it, but I'm glad you did. Um, okay, let's get into it here. Recording this on Thursday. I feel like we have to say that because people have messaged me before and said, you know, I'm listening to the podcast and you're talking about a game that happened a while ago. So if you're listening to this later, recording this on Thursday, February 16th, right? Yes, it is the 16th today. Um, and the Vancouver Canucks last night uh, losing to the New York Rangers, but getting a big win in the standings when it comes to their draft lottery odds and that's a big theme of today's episode as we see at the bottom there the ticker says tank hard for oh, look at it. bedard Can canucks now tied chris tied with the arizona coyotes who get this beat the tampa bay lightning in a shootout last night it was a one nothing shootout victory for the arizona coyotes over the tampa bay lightning uh the canucks and coyotes now tied in the standings with 46 points yeah but tiebreaker goes to the uh, coyotes so the canucks are the fifth worst team in the league and i ran the simulator four times today right because i was just like okay hey, i'm gonna run it until i get the first overall pick in the four times that i ran the simulator the canucks got they dropped a spot and then they got second second again and then first so things are looking pretty good in tank land and i mean everything it's wild watching some of the teams around them you know, Montreal's on a three-game winning streak. Uh, Arizona's on a two-game winning streak. St. Louis, Ottawa, they're all winning. And you just look at the Canucks over the last 10 games, they have the worst record tied with Columbus and Chicago. And things are looking pretty good for Team Tank. And I think we've seen that already in the chat. People are getting excited about what the Tank is looking like. This is the first time uh, our thumbnail has had Connor Bedard in it. So the fact that we've gone into, what? It, yeah, like you said, February 16th, we haven't had, haven't had to use a Connor Bedard uh, photo in a thumbnail. That feels pretty good, but now it's it's on. The tank is on, baby. I'm I'm excited uh, for what's coming here because a lot of things pointing in the right direction of getting this team to tank as much as possible. And uh, you want to start with Archer Seelovs? You want to start there? Yes, let's start there. Let's start with Archer Seelovs. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll break it down. I feel like people are waiting for me to give my take on this. And it's similar to yesterday because there were still people complaining. I still saw the people say, why would you do this to Archer Seelovs? Look, he's a pro goaltender. And look, I, I, I knew it would be the case, but you talked to him post game. Did it not just seem like water off a duck's back when like he, he didn't seem rattled at all about that game. If anything, he was happy that he got that opportunity. And again, like, like, like you talked to him post game. Is that not the vibe you got from Artie Seelovs? Yeah, 100%. It was, you know, the smile on his face when I asked him about uh, making a save one-on-one -on -one with Artemi Panarin was pretty good. He said, like, he, he felt really good matching up against some of the best players and best scorers in the league. And 
yeah, I don't think this is going to be the thing that wrecks his career or development. I mean, that's a little extreme, but I don't even think this is a step back. I actually do think that, you know, I'm watching that game and I was just thinking, just don't give up seven. Like, don't, he lets in three in the first period. I was like, just have a period now in the second where you just give up two, right? And like, and I think that's what he did. He gave up two in the second, but then didn't give up anything in the third. So overall, I, I think he got more comfortable as the game went on. Obviously that first goal was tough, right? He falls for the head fake, but then, uh, ends up just kind of allowing a pretty weak goal, but I felt like he got better throughout the game. Here's the thing, Chris, is you and I know quite a bit about Seelovs, right? Like, I've been following this guy since his draft year. You've been hearing about him since his draft year because we've been friends for that long. But for a casual fan or for any fan watching this game, you're not going to learn too much from an NHL debut for a goaltender, especially when he's playing the red-hot New York Rangers. But one thing that you and I know of to be true with Archie Seelovs and something that I think showed last night that fans got to see was the resiliency, right? And the ability to just move on. Like, it seems like nothing phases this kid. And they were talking in the intermission panel. I believe it was IMAC that relayed the story from Ryan Johnson about when Ryan Johnson called Archer Seelovs and said, hey, you're coming up and you're going to play. Seelovs was like, oh, okay, thanks for the call. Like, uh, I'll, you know, that type of thing. Like, Seelovs wasn't really phased by it. And it's similar with him on the ice. Gives up five goals. And after that, Chris, did he not look a lot more comfortable? Like, you know, maybe shaking out a little bit of jitters, whatever it is, I don't want to speak for him. But the point is, did he not just look a lot more comfortable after that fifth goal? Yeah, no, he did. And I think the interesting thing was like, uh, Kuz asked him about this a couple times. Um, asked him, like, were you surprised? He asked him, he used the word surprise in two of his questions. And both times, Silas was like, no, like, no, I wasn't surprised. Like, th that's the thing. He's not, listen, Mikey DiPietro, you brought him up earlier. He was surprised when he came into that game. Silas probably had, like, was was realizing, wow, this is a, you know, a step faster than what I've done in the AHL, but he's done it in the AHL so much this season. That's why he wasn't surprised. He didn't say that he was surprised at all with it. This is what he was expecting from the NHL. So, uh, the first goal, that one, you know, that's one that he definitely wanted back. But I felt like he battled a little bit, you know, made a couple of really good acrobatic saves. Uh, definitely still had some that just snuck through him, but also some good shots beat him last night too, right? Like the Keandre Miller shot from the point, that's right into the top corner. He missed it with his glove. Um, just a tough situation for him. But I mean, overall, it is a step in the right direction. Now that he's got that out of the way, he knows that he can be a goalie in the NHL, right? Like he's still 21 years old. He still probably shouldn't have had that start. Uh, if everything was going in the correct direction for the Canucks this season, he probably wouldn't have gotten that start. He heck, he probably wouldn't have had 35 starts in the AHL up to this point if everything was going the right direction. But uh, you have to look at it as another part of building and building. And it's something that, yeah, like now that, you know, the next time we do our prospect rankings, it's going to be included that it was nice to see him get a taste of the NHL, see what it's like to go through the daily routine of being an NHL player of pregame, of seeing the fans, of getting your cheers, like going out there and doing your rookie lap, everything, right? Like now that he's got that out of the way, it's just a continual step forward in the development uh, in my eyes for Archer Seelov. So I don't think he took a step back at all yesterday, even though he let up five goals. Because everybody, anybody going in the net for the Canucks is going to give up five goals. So it's not the worst thing in the world. I thought it was actually a really good step in the right direction for him. And, like, you know, he wasn't going to come out and get a shutout in his first game. Like, you know, that wasn't going to happen, I don't think. Not in front of this, uh, with the team in front of him anyways. So to see him pull that yesterday, yeah, I think it was a good step in the right direction for the 21-year-old. The thing that I brought up, and I put this in the instant reaction, I was having a little couple arguments with a few different people over text. But the thing that I kind of brought up was, if there's anything that does anything for confidence... Making a breakaway save off Artemi Panarin, like you said post-game, you asked him about it, he was smiling about it, like that does a lot for your confidence. You go down to the AHL now where you were already putting up ridiculously good numbers over your last five starts and you've been you've been really feeling it if you're Archer Seelovs, right? You go back down to the AHL and you've now got that under your belt, like I, I don't think this could have, or it could have, I shouldn't say could have, I don't think it negatively affected him. I think it's far more likely that he took a positive, this was a positive experience for Seelovs and now he's going to go down the AHL and I don't think he's going to miss a beat. Like, I don't think this is going to do anything to him long-term in terms of having a negative effect on him. I think it's only going to be a positive one. And Corey Anderson in the YouTube live chat here said uh, the first goal was a bit of an oops. The rest of the goals were basically on the team in front of oh, him. Yeah. But overall, a positive experience, I thought. 
Yeah, I mean, that's the other problem was I think the, the biggest problem I have is the the players letting him down in that situation on a lot of the time, right? That that was still kind of the worst thing to me was like the Canucks couldn't uh, couldn't step up and play better defense in front of him in that situation. Like uh, there were some real easy backdoor tap-ins that he can't do anything about. Almost got that long, uh, those long lanky legs uh, stretched out there. And by the way, if you go on like his prof like profile and stuff, I wrote this in the article when I did the prospect report too. Like C loves is not six, four. So people that were expecting this monster to come in there, he is not six foot four. He is six foot one, six foot two, maybe. Um, so don't, you know, whatever's on the, uh, the stat sheet is very much not true. Uh, I've stood beside him enough to know that he's not six foot four. So, you know, that's the other thing that I saw a little bit out there. People are like, Oh, he looks small and net. It's like, yeah, cause you're not, he's not six, four. Like he isn't, he, but he's, you know, six, one, six, two in that area right there. So, um, I also thought, and I chatted with uh, with Woodley a little bit about this because, uh, you know, is, is Woodley a goalie expert? I don't know. How many games of Archer Seelovs has he seen this year? Not many. So when I'm telling him about it, I said, Seelovs looks a lot smaller. He didn't, like, there was some confidence lacking from him um, in the way that you could see, and you know this with Ian Clark goaltenders, how aggressive are they? How much has Spencer Martin bought into challenging shooters so much that he's outside of his crease a lot of the time on a, on a shot from the you know, one of the half walls. So I, I think that Seelovs might've been a little nervous on attacking. And I think that's probably something that is being talked about, you know, all morning long with him and Ian Clark today is like, Hey, you got to keep that aggressive thing that we've been working on in the AHL. Cause I didn't see it. I didn't see him taking away space from shooters as much as he does in the AHL. And I just think that's a little bit of nerves. Like, cause that's, it, it's a bold thing for a goalie to do to really come out of your crease. Cause it does open up the chance for that backdoor tap in, which did happen against the Canucks. But even on the first goal, like he, he was aggressive. He got out there, but he kind of made a mistake on the head fake and didn't uh, drop into the butterfly quick enough. And I just think that a little bit more aggressive and a little bit more of a feel for the NHL pace is going to help him there. It's just, he doesn't know. He, he didn't know what the pace was going to be like in that game until he got it. So now there's something to build off of and work from and lots of, video now for him to go through of him playing against NHL players to to help him with his development moving forward now we'll break down more of the game later because we want to talk about Andre Kuzmenko but right now I want to talk about the tank and, and you kind of alluded to it about how the Canucks are right there in the standings now Chris I was looking at it uh looking at kind of the numbers lately and how the teams have been doing uh the Canucks have been the worst team in the NHL since Christmas I wrote this for Canucks Army. It was literally posted moments ago before we started recording this. But the Canucks have the worst record, the worst points percentage, you name it, lowest amount of points overall of any team in the NHL since Christmas. And I quickly want to rattle these other ones off oh, for you guys yeah. because th that's a tank, baby. That's right. And, and I will quickly want to rattle these other ones off for you because it kind of came as a bit of a surprise to me. So the only team worse than the Canucks is the Columbus Blue Jackets, who over that time, a master record of 6, 13, and 2, 14 points and a point percentage of 333. Then I'm just going to rattle off the point percentages here, okay? Followed by the Blackhawks at 405, the Coyotes at 413, the San Jose Sharks and Montreal both at 425. And get this, Chris, the Anaheim Ducks, who right now, sit with the second best lottery odds at drafting Connor Bedard at 450. Leading the pack among those teams that I just listed is the Anaheim Ducks. They have been playing the best hockey of all of those teams since Christmas. Now, the drop-off between Anaheim uh, and Chicago is, I think, 36 and 37 respectively. Or, excuse me, that's Columbus. Uh, Anaheim is in that third spot right now, not the second spot. I was getting those mixed up. But... Quickly, um, right now, the Anaheim Ducks, that's a team that the Canucks can actually reach, it would seem, in the standings as you pull up the article there, uh, which is nicely done. I, I like that you uh, you just share your screen, your highlight, and look at that. Um, I'm, I'm really interested to see, Chris, kind of how this all plays out because I also looked at the remaining schedule for the rest of the year, okay? And the Canucks have the third easiest schedule, according to Tankathon, uh, their schedule strength tool. Really, really like that tool, by the way. Um, third easiest schedule in the league. And obviously the big wild card here is Thatcher Demko, right? Like who knows what Thatcher Demko is going to do when he eventually returns. Um, you know, the defensive woes are nothing new, but the goaltending definitely hasn't been there to cover the defensive mistakes as it was last year. So that's where the biggest drop off has been. But if Demko comes back and, you know, plays like even just average, like an average NHL goaltender, the Canucks are still going to lose a lot of games, 
but the goaltending has been below average as of late, right? And I'm interested to see kind of what happens when Thatcher Demko returns here. He's the wild card in all of this, but the silver lining here is that although the Canucks have the third easiest schedule, the teams around them, a lot of the teams around them, except for the Montreal Canadiens, who have the toughest schedule of anybody in the league, again, according to Tankathon, um, the teams around them also have pretty easy schedules. And there's a lot of games against each other. And I talked about this in the article. Three matchups with the Ducks, two against each of the Coyotes, Blues, Blackhawks, Canucks are going to be playing some meaningful hockey down the stretch here, Chris. That, that's the remaining games, I should add. Uh, they still have games against all of those teams. Canucks are going to be playing meaningful hockey down the stretch. It's just going to be both teams' fan bases hoping for a loss, although an entertaining loss. Yeah, I mean, that's that's what we talked about on yesterday's show was the fact that we are scoreboard watching now, and when you start to see things, how it's playing out, you mentioned the three games against the Anaheim Ducks. Those are huge games. Those are huge games for the tank. Right, the Ducks are are what like nine points behind the Canucks. If they were to pick up six points in the Canucks, you're talking about a real good swing there, right? Like three games against the Ducks. Sorry, the Ducks are six points behind. So if they win all three of those games against the Canucks, oh, we're talking even even race here moving forward. So, um, yeah, the, the Canucks have a lot of a lot of pretty easy opponents. But I think that's the interesting thing is because they aren't going for a playoff spot, you kind of want to have the weaker schedule because if you really are tanking the correct way and you're losing to these bad teams, you want to play these bad teams as much as possible, right? And that's going to be the thing that's going to be interesting to play out is, are the Canucks going to have, and we've said this all season long, do they have enough skill to just beat these bad teams? Because I think a lot of the time they do, right? Like they simply have better players than some of these teams. But then again, like the structure and how they play is the thing that's really costing them. So they do have the potential to lose a lot of these games. And we have to see it play out. That's the thing. So to hear the Canucks have so many matchups against bottom feeder teams uh, to finish up the season, pretty exciting for me. And on top of that, uh, Oliver ekman Larson goes down yesterday during the game. First period, I believe. Didn't come out uh, for the second. Didn't come out for the third. Was ruled out, uh, I think, at some point in the second period by the Canucks. He did not. Uh, he was not at practice today out at UBC. Uh, Curtis Lazar as well lower body injury for him didn't really see what happened to Lazar uh, but he wasn't at practice today OEL I believe his left leg is the one that's given him problems in the past as well so to see him go down uh, and, and limp off the ice there he was able to like put a little bit of weight on the left leg so it wasn't like a break or something like that it looked like but definitely um, an interesting situation to follow there with uh, with him going down we see Kyle Burroughs sliding into the top four today at practice okay I have a little more on the whole tank thing uh, because over that stretch of games, Chris, and, and I know you want to talk about practice, you want to talk about the injuries, but there's not much to add. Neither of us were out at UBC today. We would be there if it was at Rogers Arena, but we weren't there because it was out at UBC. So back to the tank. The one thing I want to point out here is over that stretch of games that I've been pointing out since Christmas, right? I just pointed out all the team's records. The goals against numbers are very, very close. Like, over that stretch, the Florida Panthers have given up the third most goals against at 77, followed by the San Jose Sharks at fourth, the Canadians uh, at fifth, and the discrepancy there is 77 and another 76. It's very, very close is what I'm trying to say. The Columbus Blue Jackets at 72, and I think they're in like the eighth spot. So it's very, very close. The Vancouver Canucks, Chris, are you ready for this? Since Christmas, have given up 95 goals against the next closest team is the ducks at 83 that is a massive drop off and you don't see a drop off like that I'm, i literally have it right in front of me right now you do not see a drop off like that literally throughout the rest of the league until you get to like even the top teams in the league like the boston bruins have a pretty significant drop off but even then it's not nearly as significant as what the canucks have given up yeah that's a huge number i'm just trying to see you said since Christmas, right? That's the that's yes. when it happened. I'm just trying to see like how yes. many games since Christmas there in total. It's like what is that? Uh, twenty two games. You got up ninety five goals against. Yes, it is twenty two yeah, games. You're, you're exactly. It is twenty two games. You know, you're well over twenty. You're, sorry, you're well over four goals per game at that point. You're you're getting closer to to five goals a game. Uh, than you are four, I think, just off my quick math there. But they've only you know, and, and on top of that, this is a team that likes to battle with chances, battle with offense as well. They've only got 71 goals in those 22 games. So just over three goals, but well over four goals against. Yeah, that's the tank's looking good, man. Uh, you know, the tank, I, I don't know. 
I wonder, I always say like if the Canucks had better process, some of their decisions would be obviously made differently, but they'd also set themselves up better with just like this. Maybe this is stupid, but like with the hockey gods and just the hockey, you know, feeling. And if you do the right process, better things will happen to you. This feels like, I don't know. I don't want to get excited about the draft lottery, but I tell you, I did. I ran it four times today and the Canucks picked in the top two, three of the four times. And we won't start the conversation of, oh, maybe the Canucks could trade up for the first overall pick if they have the second overall pick. But quickly, you mentioned it, 70 goals for the Canucks over those games since Christmas. Chris, that ranks them seventh best in the league. So while they have the worst record, the worst record in the NHL, the worst record in the entire league over this stretch, they have also scored the seventh most goals uh just to put into perspective how poor the canucks are at keeping the puck out of their net and again i'm not trying to rain on the tank parade or the the lottery parade draft lottery parties are a lot of fun but you do worry with thatcher demko coming back that this isn't going to be sustainable for the canucks because let's be honest here their problem isn't scoring goals it's giving goals up and thatcher demko no matter how bad you think the defense is thatcher demko is probably going to help them give up less goals Right, but I also think it would be ridiculous to play Thatcher Demko even close to what he was doing last year. Like, not even yeah. necessarily, like, expect play from him, but to play him for the same amount of games. Like, this season should be a complete write-off. There should be no risk to overworking your goaltender of the future because if that's what you believe he is, that's what you need to treat him as as the season goes on is this isn't the goaltender of here and now, right? Like, he is. He'll be the starter, but he, it doesn't really matter that he's the starter right now you're worried about Thatcher Demko as the starter next season. It does not matter if he's the starter this year. Heck, I wouldn't care if Colin Delia played more games than him to finish the season. Like a lot of people on Team Tank would probably like that, especially if Demko gets back to form. And I think that's the thing you want to see from him in the end is just have those games where he looks really good, right? And then end up losing 2-1 or something like that, you know? But like, just like, don't put him even close to the workload that he has had for the Canucks ever since becoming the starter. I would, that's what I'm saying. I wouldn't even make him like, I wouldn't make him the for sure starter every night. Like it shouldn't be us watching, you know, talking to Rick talking after practices thing, it, you know, is Demko your starter? Like, I want the question to be like, who's, who's in net for you tonight. I want there to be some question in my mind that it's not just Demko every single night. That's what I'd like to see the end of the season be like. Well, yeah, I mean, there, I was going to bring that up is there's benefit to that for Demko and there's obviously benefit to it as well. For the Canucks, are we are we going to see Artie Silovs and Thatcher Demko split starts down the stretch here? Who knows? It might be Delia, but again, I do like the idea of splitting starts. Like I, I definitely don't hate the idea of that. Uh, regardless, you got to limit uh, Demko's workload for sure. Okay, what do you got next up? Well, yeah, I want to sneak this in here. Jake Livingstone. People are asking about Jake Livingstone. Uh, is he on the phones last couple days here? The Canucks are one of the teams that have shown interest in Jake Livingstone and the Canucks are one of the teams that I don't want to call it the short list. Cause I think there's a lot like from what I've heard is almost every single team is in on Jake Livingstone. They have shown interest in Jake Livingstone, who by the way, is a right shot defenseman uh, coming out of Minnesota state man, Cato. Uh, there's a lot of interest from the NHL about him. He's 23 years old right now. He's going to be uh, 24 basically at when he signs his ELC with a team. If he signs at the start of April, the Canucks are one of the teams of interest on him. I think from what I've heard in conversations is the Canucks are also a team of interest to him. So there are other teams as well. Like I, I do think there are other teams. I'm not saying the Canucks are the front runner, but there is definitely mutual interest from his camp and from the Vancouver Canucks to make him a Vancouver Canuck. So I'll say that. Okay. There you have it folks. There you have it, Jake Livingstone. Livingstone. Um, okay. I wanted to get to, let's move on to the next thing on the ticker here. Shuffle the deck chairs up. I got one thing. I got okay. one thing here. Uh, people are going to ask, and people have been asking, with Livingstone, how close is he to being an NHL defenseman? And how close is he to being a first pairing defenseman on the Canucks? Because those are clearly two different things. Yeah, it's uh, he's he's not close to being an NHL defenseman. He he is an NHL defenseman. He'll play in the NHL when he signs out of university. Jake Livingstone is at that level where there was talk of him coming to the NHL last year. He got another full year developing, you know, getting older. He's 24 years old when he signs this deal. Like I said, he will go into the NHL. He's not a guy who's going to play in the AHL, I don't think. 
Um, aside from that, listen, if you're talking about being a top pairing guy on the Vancouver Canucks and you're a right shot defenseman, it's not going to take very much. And I think that is something that Canucks have in their pocket to say, hey, we have playing time for you at the NHL with Quinn Hughes as your partner. That's what I think is going to sell the deal for Jake Livingstone if he picks the Vancouver Canucks. Where else is he going to get that type of opportunity in the NHL? Like nobody, right? No one's going to have that option for him. And if you aren't 100% sold on Ethan Bear being the, the partner of the future for Quinn Hughes, the Canucks should absolutely give that opportunity to Jake Livingstone. He's bigger. He's you know obviously going to have to make a big adjustment coming from the NCAA to pro hockey. But I also think that I want to put this the right way. So making the jump from, we talked about it actually even yesterday on the show, making the jump from the CHL, whether that be the dub, the the O or the Q, jumping up from that league into the AHL is a big jump. I think it's a smaller jump going from NCAA hockey to the NHL. Like the NCAA hockey is getting to a level right now where these top five teams in the NCAA, actually this year, almost like top eight. Like there's a lot of extremely, like there's a lot of NHL caliber players right now in the NCAA. I don't think you can say the same thing about the CHL. Like, could Connor Bedard play in the NHL right now? Probably. And he'd probably have somewhat of success. But he's not as big and strong already as these NCAA guys, right? Like, these guys are bigger and stronger. Some of them are 22, 23, 24 years old. That jump from the NCAA to the NHL isn't as massive, in my eyes, of going from junior hockey to the AHL. And it's like a completely different look because it's a very different age group. You're more developed. You've played better hockey. You've probably had, like, I think the NCAA coaching system is incredible. It's a little different kind of vibe than it is with uh, with the CHL because you got, it's just, it's, it's a Canadian American little difference of like development and, and junior hockey almost to a certain degree, right? So I, I just don't think that jump is that big. And I think the Canucks, from what I've heard anyways, is there's some other guys that they're in on in the NCAA as well. Um I, I, I'm keeping an eye on Jacob Truscott. I, I think Jacob Truscott is going to sign with the Vancouver Canucks at the end of his season with Michigan. Um, there's also Ryan McAllister, who I know the Canucks have at least had interest and in, in shown interest with the camp. That's another NCAA guy leading right now the NCAA in scoring. So keep an eye on those three names, Jacob Truscott being the only one that is a prospect. I think the Canucks are going to be busy on the NCAA uh, free agent market this year, and I hope that uh, they're in the market on these top guys who – are looking to jump into the NHL and the Canucks have opportunity for these guys to jump into the NHL. That's their selling point. I mean, when you think about the process for NCAA players where they pick, like how they pick their teams, the process is basically they sit down with their agent. They look at potential playing time. They look at the team's success level. They look at past development of prospects, which maybe that doesn't bode super well for the Canucks. But I think, you know, and again, I haven't talked to any any sources about this. The last time I did, they were just telling me that uh, the Canucks' reputation has definitely been tarnished with their prospect development, but they are rebuilding that with this new management regime, right? So again, I don't know uh, how well received that those changes have been so far, but you'd have to imagine that it's good. Obviously, the Canucks would need to get some more wins from their Abbotsford development program in order to um, you know, really spread the message about that. All I know is the Canucks' reputation before wasn't great, and I know that that has affected them in the past. Like, I do know for a fact that there was at least one NCAA free agent who thought about signing with the Canucks and then looked at past treatment of a player and said, you know what, we're going somewhere else, and they went somewhere else. I'm not going to say who. I'm not going to say anything else beyond that, but I'm just saying that it has affected them in the past. And you would hope now, especially with what you just brought up, the playing time opportunity and that sort of stuff, you would hope that the reputation has been built to a point now where a player would look at it and say, yeah, you know what? Working with the Sedins, that's somewhere I want to be. Yeah, and you hope that uh, Aid McDonough has that same feeling too, right? The, the Canucks is actual top prospect in the NCAA right now. You hope that, like you said, with prior relationships, with his best friend being already with the organization, how things have gone for Rathbone. Got to wonder what happens, but you got to hope that there's a hunger there uh, from McDonough to actually be with that development group. Because yes, that development staff has been getting a lot of praise so far this season with what they're doing in the AHL, right? Like, I think they're doing a good, like a very good job with Danila Klimovich. I think they're doing a really good job with RCD Baines. I think they're doing a good job with, with Pod Colson, getting him that confidence back. The Sedins are doing a good job out there, right? So it'll be interesting to see uh, what happens with the NCAA market because there's some real talent coming out of this year. Um, 
in especially around the top like you know the McAllister the the Livingstone even make yeah well you you wanted to talk about um what's a move you would take back from the last year for the Vancouver Canucks so we'll start there because we're already at 130 here um let's just I was gonna say we'll do this line thing another day um what's a move that you would take back from the last year I I'll start because I don't know if this was even in the past year because I think it came in January but the the offer from the Rangers like I would take back declining that for JT Miller I would take that for sure um and then aside from that I I you know it's it's probably the JT Miller contract again like you know extending him on that uh on the seven years I think that's yeah it hasn't worked out great so far this season I just wonder what there was like to see on the trade market with a guy who you probably could have gone into this year as well and made an option with him you probably could have kept Bo like there would have been a lot of different things you would have done I think it's an easy kind of a really easy decision for me if, if you take back a something from the past year it's the JT Miller extension here's the thing Chris is those two things that you just brought up like the turning down the Rangers reported package of Heedle Lundqvist uh in a first turning that down and not extending Miller those two things go hand in hand which makes it in my mind the surefire choice but yeah. I'll entertain some other ones because there was a lot of people that replied to this. We put it out on Twitter. Uh, it was the subject of our What Do You Think Thursday article over at CanucksArmy.com. Uh, shout out Stefan Roger as always. Um, and I had to remind people that the OEL Garland trade was over a year ago. Because if you look at the last, I don't know, let's say 10 years, that's probably the surefire one is the OEL Garland trade. But when you're looking at the last calendar year, and again, uh, we're, we're being a little generous here because we believe that that trade offer from the Rangers came down in January. Uh, it was before the trade deadline for sure. It wasn't like a last minute thing. Um, we're extending the criteria a little bit here, but if we go a little more recent, I think there's a serious case to be made for giving up a second round pick and Jason Dickinson only to get Riley Stillman in return. Like I think I think that's up there. I don't. I don't think it's as detrimental in terms of where this franchise is at, um, of the Miller extension, obviously. But you gave up an asset. Like you, you gave up an asset to get out of what you thought was some bad money, which is fine. I'm not. I'm not here to say that the Dickinson contract was great by any means, but you gave up an asset to get out of that, and you require a defenseman who just hasn't been able to stick. Like I'm not going to start slagging on Riley Stillman, but I just. Like you look at that, you gave up an asset to acquire Riley Stillman and to get out of that contract. And again, I just like that's one move that I think you could make a legitimate case and say, you know what, it would have been nice to um, not have to do that. Well, that move was made when the Canucks thought they were a contending team for the playoffs, and that's that's the problem. Is if I would take things, if I could take one massive thing back, it would be that all the moves point you in the same direction. Because has this not been the problem for the Vancouver Canucks for the last ten years of? take three steps down this path, but then turn left and take two down this way, then turn around and take a step back and then take a step forward. And it's just like, stay on the same path. I think if you could change or take back one thing from all this year, I would say I'd take back all the the steps towards being a contender, right? I would take steps directly towards being in a rebuild or being in a retool, whatever you want to call it. Because this management group, though they've talked about a retool a lot this year, I don't think they were preaching about a retool slash rebuild at the start of the season or in the off season when they're out there signing McKayev and extending JT Miller. I don't think they were doing that. I think they were, their thoughts were that this team was going to contend for a playoff spot. A lot of people did. We thought it was, a, we, we gave them a pretty decent chance. If things fell in the right direction, we said they'd be a playoff team, right? If you got Thatcher Demko back to being one of the top goalies and, and you know, having maybe not top of the league save percentage of five and five, but even just like up there in the top 10, this Canucks team would be very different. If the penalty kill improved with Ilya Mikheyev coming into the mix and, you know, different coaching staff and all this stuff, like we, we gave them a, a half decent chance of being a playoff team. If things went their direction, things have not gone that direction. And it feels like if you would have made all those moves in that way, you would have been okay to kind of see this team actually taking steps in one direction instead of just a bunch of different steps and you know building here retooling here uh brick after brick here we're going for the playoffs like all this stuff if you just took steps down the same path it's going to be incredibly good for the canucks moving forward here so you hope that they're on that track now but i still don't really know if that's where they're at yeah exactly and again it's it's almost like 
you just have to monitor what they're doing and say, okay, well, I like this and I don't like this type thing. Uh, there's over 50 replies to this tweet and I want to get as many in as I can, uh, but a lot of them are very, very similar. Uh, one person brought up, actually a few people brought this up, uh, bringing back Bruce and his coaching staff. Uh, with the benefit of hindsight, I suppose you would undo that. But I, I think in the moment, like, you know, all the wins that Bruce, uh, Bruce or the Canucks got under Bruce, I don't think that anybody was really saying, okay, don't bring this guy back. Like, I think it came as a shock to a lot of people when the Canucks said they didn't want to bring him back on a multi-year deal, right? I think that genuinely surprised a good amount of people. So again, lots of different answers. Um, but again, I think the, the, the surefire one that I think everybody is kind of pointing out uh, is the JT Miller extension. Yeah, I would have taken if I if you're talking the coaching stuff, what you could take back, I would take back how long you let this drag out when you knew Rick Tockett was going to be the coach. The you know, this should have been something that was discussed with Tockett. He would have been aware that he was coming in. I don't know, maybe he could have quit TNT or wherever he was at before. So it didn't have like a perfect timeline of him lining up for it and having to wait. What was it like a, a two weeks or a six week thing? I can't remember, but like everybody knew that situation looks really bad. That was still just like that whole situation that was and how it was handled this season still is like one of the biggest low points from the organization, from my point of view of covering this team. That's just how I look at the Boudreaux situation. I think that's something that from a, you know, how does this look to the public eye? I think the Canucks wish they could take that back. Yeah, there's, there's no doubt. Uh, Corey Anderson brought up one that I hadn't seen yet. So I want to point it out because nobody else brought it up. I don't think. This may be one that's not discussed very much. How about instead of signing Besser to term, you just give him his $7.5 million qualifying offer, making him easier to move this year. Of course, that means Besser would have been signed for one year, um, would have been a free agent at the end of this season. Restricted free agent, uh, if I am not mistaken. So that's an interesting one. Interesting one to consider. We don't have time to delve into it too much, but I wanted to get it out because I, I do like it. I do like it. It's. I think it's a good one. Uh, do you want to try and fit in Kuzmenko here, or do you want to just wait till you and Harmon can talk about it? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'll just bring up the numbers, right? Like, you know, 16 minutes, uh, 12 seconds with an assist versus Detroit on Monday, 18 minutes and 16 seconds with a goal and an assist last night uh, against the Rangers. And I tell you, that assist he had, how about that play, though? Coming in backwards, passing it through his own legs, picking it up on the other side, roofing it off of the post out to Garland. Garland buries it, I tell you. Kuzmenko's a lot of fun to watch, and I know uh, Rick Tockett said that Kuzmenko came up to him and said that he wants more video work, that Kuzmenko wants to to do more stuff with video with him. And Tockett also mentioned that Sergey Gonchar spending a lot of time working with Kuzmenko. Very, like I've, since this whole coaching staff came in here, I've said I think Sergey Gonchar is the one that I'm like, Listen, I know he's an uh, associate or assistant. What are we calling this? A coach? Associate coach? I want to get it right. Assistant. Assistant coach. That's You're getting assistant. alternate Isn't captains it? confused. Don't worry about that. Uh, so if he's I, – I just think Goncher is on uh, – you know, just from what I see at practice and how he's working with players and how he's kind of teaching, I, I like the way he's doing that. And I think it really helps with him being able to, you know, speak Russian with, with Kuzmenko. I think that really helps. Like it's nice to have Pod Colson in there to help. It's nice to have C-Laws in there to help now, I guess, too. But uh, at the same time, you know, when you actually have a coach, when you're trying to be taught something from a coach, like if Pod Colson's having to explain certain things for him that might be a little bit difficult, that's tough. But when it's a coach who can speak your language, I think that makes a big difference in how he can actually learn what the coach is trying to get across to him. So that's big in my eyes. Uh, and I'm wondering if Gonchar might, uh, like, I don't think he's going to, but it'd be interesting if he got out to Abbotsford too, right? Like, it, I'd be curious if maybe one day he heads out there with, like, with the Sedins. Uh, and just kind of works with some of those guys out there, specifically like watching him with Klimovich to kind of help him with that same kind of deal of like really understanding what you're trying to learn, whether it be video work or a drill in practice. But to have someone that speaks your actual language, I think would be a big boost for a player that likely understands what's trying to be said, but does he really truly understand what this drill means or what he's trying to say with this video here? I think that's a, a thing that I would like to potentially see, but it doesn't feel like it. Cause I think Gonchar is strictly with the NHL club and I don't think he's even going to be in Vancouver every day either. He's, he's around a little bit more. The thing I like the most, I think of all of this, Chris, and obviously Kuzmenko's had two really strong games here is talk. It gave him props after the game last night about how Kuzmenko is asking for more video, more video. Like Kuzmenko wants to get better. It's not like he's saying I was putting up these points. You benched me. And then, you know, 
uh, complains to management or gets his agent to complain to management and say, look, they're not playing me. I'm, I'm pissed off about this. Like Kuzmenko wants it to work out. Like Kuzmenko wants to figure it out. Uh, and IMAX been talking about the um, separate workout regimen that, uh, that Kuzmenko's on. And again, like it's just dedication to the craft. It seems like for Kuzmenko. And again, that's what you want to see. That's what you want to see from this player right now. And again, I just, I, I keep saying again, but I really do like what Kuzmenko is doing uh, with this situation that he's in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Before we get to Betway here, um, I know uh, Alex is going to want this. Uh, the YouTube channel. Nice little bump yesterday from from us mentioning to them. We almost, I don't think we got almost close to it, but if we if we get another couple little bumps here past those freaking guys over there in Toronto, that's what we need to happen. So we're getting, uh, we clo oh, what they had a good day too. They were at like 440 yesterday. What the hell happened? Alex, what the hell happened yesterday at Least Nation? They, What's going they on had here? a good day. They had a good oh, day. My God. You know what? I'm getting I'm getting Livingstone on the show. People will want that, they right? They interviewed one of the prospects there. Matthew Nyes, Dreger was on the show. Oh, the most overrated NCAA player, Matthew Nyes. No, we're getting Livingstone next week. He's coming on the show. I'll just text him. Livingstone better guess a bump. I thought we were catching him. I thought we were. I thought they were at four forty eight. I, I guess I forgot that they could also add uh, subscribers too. So, <laughs> damn it. But anyways, it's in the link in description. Head over there and get at least get us to maybe four hundred tonight. That would be amazing. That'd be really cool. Okay, we can grow that. that. Way. Let's go. All right, that way, that way, that way. Also, it's been like a year and a half since anybody's reviewed this show on Apple Podcasts. So like, maybe someone, maybe someone. Could do that. I try not to ask people to do so much. Now I'm giving people like a a chore list to do uh, for the rest of the day. But I, I just appreciate. I haven't seen a review in a year and a half over there on Apple. I don't think people even know what's going on over there. All right, let's get to the Betway uh, bets of the day. I won't. Uh, I won't. You know, psych you out anymore there, Alex. I know you got the graphic already. Uh, all right, no Canucks game tonight. Instead, we are rocking with the Detroit Red Wings facing off against the Calgary Flames. Let's get going into it. My either or bets, you know I love these. Going with a couple of Red Wings in this one. Dylan Larkin or Tyler Bertuzzi to score Betway in this game tonight. Minus 134 over on Betway, Betway, Betway. A $10 bet on Betway will get you a seventeen fifty return. If you hit with a goal from Dylan Betway Larkin or Tyler Betway Bertuzzi, in that game against the Calgary Flames. And then the big one on Betway, they don't like when I do this, but plus 1,100 for the Red Wings to win over 6.5 total goals. And I'm rocking with Larkin again because I thought he looked really good against the Canucks the other night there. Uh, and I think he's trying to get himself out of uh, out of Detroit and onto a contender. So I think he's going to be playing hard, scoring a goal, Red Wings winning over 6.5 total goals. The odds on this on Betway, plus 1,100. A $10 bet's going to get you 120. That, that 120... Hmm. Depends if I have if we have some drinks or not. But that would likely cover my Valentine's Day dinner tonight. Uh, 120 should cover the whole thing. I'd expect, but I've never been to this place before. But I've heard good things. So maybe it will, maybe it won't. But either way, plus one, uh, plus one thousand one hundred. There, that's a lot. Eleven hundred. Nineteen plus. If you choose to play, please play responsibly. We'll wrap it up there. Your, uh, do you have uh, anything else, nope. Chris? What, what's your uh, what's your go to here on the Valentine's Day for uh, for dinner? A appetizers, a bunch of small plates. You got to you got to. Uh, well, here's. Share I don't want to give the place away, um, but I don't think we'll be doing appetizers at this type of place where it's it's more of a they're famous for their mains. Okay, they, we might get one little. No, not you. you. No, show it up to give an no, autograph or something. What are you talking about? No, I don't. I don't sign more than three autographs a week. Uh, it's gonna. I just don't want my fiance to be. I want her to be surprised with where we're going, and I know oh. she's watching. Right now, so that's all I'm saying. Okay. I, she knows. There's <laughs> nothing I love more than when somebody comes up to me on the street and, and tells me that they recognize me from YouTube. This is my. It's my favorite thing in the whole world. I love it more than tapioca pudding, and I love tapioca pudding, but. Uh, no, I just don't want uh, my fiance to know. It's a little bit of a su surprise, and and I got to hustle too. That's I nice. got to pick her up at four from work after she saved kids' lives all day, and then I got to take her straight the the reservations for five. So a little bit worried there. We'll see. Okay, 
We'll close it out there. Uh, for my co-host, Chris Faber, and our technical producer, Alex Allard, my name is David Quadrelli. Thank you so much for listening to another episode of the Canucks Conversation. That's not a live video. My camera crashed. That's just a photo. Thanks for listening to Canucks Conversation. Hit the subscribe button to never miss an episode. How about keep it to a thank you, Jim?